to connect you. One way we do that is the connection guide that the host team handed you as you came into your campus today. I uh, just want to highlight a few items like Discover Riverwoods at the Benton campus following the 1030 service. So if you register, be sure and stay after the 1030 service. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to register, now we don't want you to miss an opportunity. Uh, this is where you can find out what Riverwoods Church believes and uh, why we do what we do and how we do it. Also, the gathering is coming up June 8th. Uh, that is all of our campuses coming together to worship uh, and be one church uh, that's in one location that day. Even though we worship in multiple locations every Sunday, we're going to be in one location on that Sunday. You still have time to sign up for Underground Church, so go to riverwoodschurch.com, register by clicking the uh, application next to the Underground Church logo on the homepage. Thanks so much for being at Riverwoods Church today. Someone at your campus will come and welcome you now, and we'll continue in worship. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, man, y'all were way better than the 9 o'clock crowd. Wow. Good job. Glad you're here this morning. My name's Darren. If you're new, uh, thank you for being here. If you're a regular tender, thank you for showing up. Uh, crowd seems down a little bit. We put out about 50 more chairs. So it's one thing, but then another thing, it's the first week after school's out, right? Uh, Wow, uh, yeah, they're gone, right? I don't blame them. I've been gone too. I'd want to go somewhere and leave the Rugrats with somebody else, so, you know, but uh, uh, I'm sure they're out having a good time with their family. We're glad that you're here. If you are new, I want to ask you along with our regular attenders to do something for me, and that is if you would take out inside your connection uh, guide what we call our connection card, if you'd fill that out and place it in the offering bucket when it's passed, we're going to do that pretty soon, so uh, you need to be writing quick. The great thing about it is on the back, you have a place where you can show interest in several different things, or better yet, you can write down a prayer request. If you write it back here and you don't want it to be emailed out, if you'll just mark that little area that says share with pastor and staff only, we won't send that out, and we'll just share that with uh, uh, the staff. And we will pray for you. Uh, there'll be many that'll pray for you if you put that on there. Uh, any other way we can help you, let us know. Just mark it on that card. If you don't use that, or if you don't use your offering envelope, we're going to ask that you would leave them in your seat. That way we will pick those up. And I would tell you this, if you want to take an extra one or so of those home with you and also an offering envelope, you can fill that out before you come. You don't even have to worry about that. When you get up after you get ready on Sunday morning, sit down, fill that out, get here a little bit early, and then when the offering bucket's passed, you can just drop it. Uh, right in or better yet on the offer and go online and and sign up and here's one reason we like for you to give online last week was holiday weekend a lot of people wasn't going to come to church so rather than make a lose out of it we make a win out of it we used to do worship in the park we do party down south I had a lot of people party down south but there's a lot of people that normally attend because holiday weekend weren't there but if you'd signed up to give online guess what your tithe would come on in anyway. A tithe isn't that you just give it when you come, it's that you give it of your, of your income. And our expenses go on, and so that way, you know, it just ensured that it come on. So those of you that have signed up to give online, man, thank you for doing that. I mean, that's just a conscious commitment you've made that no matter what, you're going to give. You're like, well, what if I make extra money that week? Well, you can drop it in the offering bucket. It'll be all right. Amen. Uh, it don't mean that you can't do that. So I encourage you to do that. And that's just off of your, off of your mind. And you've just made a conscious commitment that no matter what, you're worshiping God through your giving. And that way your offering always comes. So with that being said, if you missed last week and you're a regular tender of Riverwoods, think about making that up and adding that to this week. We had about one-third the offering we normally have last week or maybe one-fourth the offering. Uh, that we normally have because of the holiday weekend. So uh, please keep that in mind. Pray uh, that as we take up the offering that God will use it and bless it. And I'll tell you about the things Logan told you about. They're in the connection guide. Read it. Uh, we don't just print it and then tell you. Take it home. Read it. We'll say this. Discover Riverwoods. If you've never been through it, like to go through it. If you say you didn't sign up, that'll be okay. Stay today right after this service. We'll feed you lunch, provide child care after lunch. It'll take about an hour and a half. Uh, you can find out who we are, what we believe, where we're headed, and if you want to tie on to this ship or not. And uh, so it'll be a great way for you to learn. Great way to make an informed decision about Riverwoods Church. You don't have to join. don't have to be part of us. 
Uh, but I'm going to say this, that if you are going to be part of us and want to become a member, you've got to go through Discover Riverwood. So I encourage you to stay with us today uh, as we do that. All right, everybody awake now? Good, let's stand. We're going to stand this time. And then, uh, we're going to stand. I'm going to pray. Ushers are coming. Uh, then we're going to sing a little more in worship. All right, I want to hear you singing today. They need some help. Uh, some of our ladies are sick, and some of them's having to work, and Patrick's sick. So y'all help this male ensemble out up here today. All right? Uh, what do we call them? The Three Amigos? I don't know. You know, it's probably... Uh, the three of them there. I told the first crowd, I said, we've got the male talk testosterone group up here. And uh, they're leading us in worship. But thank God for them. Amen. Uh, they've done pretty good so far. Uh, yeah. And if they don't, we just turn them up louder so it don't make a difference. All right? Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you for the privilege to be here uh, and worship you. Thank you for the privilege uh, to know your greatest gift, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, if there's one that doesn't know you today, God, I pray you'd touch their heart. God, I pray somehow that you would uh, uh, emblazon upon the heart of Riverwood Church the passion to reach people for Jesus. God, one of the ways we do that is by giving. Thank you for the privilege to give today. Out of the abundance that you've given us, we give to you. God, sometimes even out of our own need and our own poverty, we give. God, we know that you take it and you bless it because you've said so in your word. We thank you for that. Uh, God, thank you for every volunteer today. Thank you for those that are here, for someone new. God, thank you for sending them in. God, you get glory to yourself today. Change lives. Help us to get lower and you to get higher and help us to get out of the way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Your love never fails, never gives up. Never runs down on me.
all five uh, campuses are meeting at this time. Four by five campuses were together yesterday uh, as we ministered to the heart of Nashville uh, in the housing projects and, and to the uh, homeless there yesterday. And it was a great time. If you didn't go, you missed out. Uh, if you did pray for us or if you sent food or if you went, thank you. Uh, God used that and we were able to touch some people uh, yesterday. And you say, why would you do that? Because of what Jesus teaches us here that I'm going to be talking about today. And so Jesus began the church during his earthly ministry. Now it had its launch. It had its public manifestation there on the day of Pentecost. They were empowered. But as you study the book of Acts, you will understand that the, the story in the book of Acts is about the growth of the church. The church growing. And we see that and how that it uh, uh, moved forward. Now I want you to know the book of Acts, if you've not spent much time there, you need to spend some time there. I mean, it's one of those thrilling books of the Bible. I mean, you get to see what God's doing through the early church. And, and I mean, folks are being saved, lives are being changed, bondages are being broken, captives are set free, demons are cast out, healing comes. I mean, it's just a, one of those amazing books in the Word of God. But here's what I want you to understand is that that still happens today. The book of Acts is, is an unfinished book. When you read other books of the Bible, they have an ending, they have a closing, they have a benediction, so to speak, uh, that they wind things up. But when you read the last chapter, chapter 28, the book of Acts, it's just reading on along there and it just stops. And it doesn't have a close. Somebody's like some of it's lost. No, I don't believe that. It's the unfinished book. And the reason that it's not finished is because the acts of God through the churches is not complete yet. That is because that's not going to be complete until Jesus Christ comes again and he what delivers his church out of this world. And so it is an unfinished book. Why? Because God's letting the, the chapters still to be written. And so that's why we entitled this, Let's Write Our Own Chapter. Uh, there's a mission organization called Acts 29. In other words, they're still uh, doing things. We can be Acts 29. We can be Acts 30, Acts 31. I don't... I don't know what chapter that we can be, but I want us to write our own chapter to the movement of God. I don't know if you know this or not, but just in recent time, there has been a report that's come out that uh, Southern Baptists have posted. They post that every year. It's about their annual church profile. And uh, what we understand is, again, this year, uh, church attendance is down and baptisms are down. Uh, that's been going on for several years now. Now, I want to say this before you're so quick to jump on Southern Baptist. Their report's better, if not better than all, it's better than most. And so it's not just something that's happening with Southern Baptist. It's something that's happening. And when I say this, I'm not talking about particular churches, but I'm using it in the generic sense. The church as a whole uh, is losing ground. When you consider... When you consider population growth with new church growth, it is astronomical how much ground that we've lost since 1960. In, in the last 40 years, we are way down. We should have many, many more churches than we have to keep up with the population growth. And so we haven't done that, and now our church attendance is going down. And when I read that report, here's what it said, is that one-fourth of all Southern Baptist churches did not baptize a single person. And so when they filled out their report, they had to put a goose egg on it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're not going to put a goose egg on a report. Amen? I mean, if I have to get my neighbor's dog and cat and baptize them, we will. If I have to baptize my wife and my three kids again and myself, we'll, we'll do it. We're not putting a goose egg on a report, okay? And, and, and many of the other churches baptize very, very few. And so it's... What's realistic in our day is, is that what we are losing ground. And one of the reasons we're losing ground is that the church has not focused on what God intended it to focus on. And so we need to understand that we're trying to make the church more of a social club than we are what God intended for it to be. And so when the absence of God, when the absence of the presence of the Holy Spirit, when the absence of the activity of Jesus Christ is gone, we have what we call dead churches. There are dead Sunday school classes. There's dead churches. There's dead denominations. There are dead services. All of those things are happening. And so what in a general decline. And uh, 
And I want you to know that God never intended the church to be that way. And when a church is not growing, there's some reason why it's not growing. It's unhealthy. Now, you can blame it on anything in the world that you want to blame it on, uh, but there is something going on that's unhealthy uh, about that congregation because a living organism, and it is an organism, not an organization, uh, when it is healthy, it grows. When it's unhealthy, it dies. And so what the church is a living organism, and God intended it to move forward. But when it is dead, and by the way, y'all know this, I don't like anything dead. I don't like dead singing, dead praying, dead preaching, uh, dead services. I was a licensed funeral director and bomber. I did that for a number of years in my life. I'm a resurrection life kind of guy. I like things alive. Some of you got a little nervous when some people shouted a while ago. I'll just tell you how I am. I'm like, why didn't everybody shout? I mean, why don't everybody, you know, just, just go ahead and, and, and let loose and let God have his way. And you know what? If you'll just, you let me tell you, and I know somebody like that's just not my personality. Well, some of it is you're not full enough of Jesus. Amen. If you get full enough of Jesus, it'll spill out. I promise you. And uh, it doesn't have to show up by shouting, but it'll show up. Amen. Uh, I mean, it won't be like, I'm here. Bless me if you can today, preacher. I mean, it won't be that. It'll be, you'll be glad to be here and it'll show and it'll come. Uh, and it'll be there, so we're going to try to help you get what more alive, more connected, more full of what God's wanting to do. But when the presence, listen to me now, when the presence of God is around, you know what amazing things happen? People get saved. Shackles get broken. Bondages are removed. People are set free. Uh, addictions are removed. Demons are cast out. And you're like, man, what are you talking about? I ain't never seen that stuff happen in church. Well, you must not have been at one where he's alive. <laughs> Just go ahead and tell yourself. And by the way, all of that, listen to me now, all of that happened in the early church. And I know what somebody's saying, oh, the preacher, that don't happen in our day. Since the canon of, of Scripture is complete, those things don't happen. Wrong. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Now that's what the Word of God says, is that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you agree with that? That means what He once did, He still does. Amen? And if He ever did, He still can. The problem's not with God. The problem's with us and our belief. The problem is, we're like what Vance Havner says, we are so subnormal that normal seems abnormal. And I mean, we get all scared to death. Oh, man, when you get scared of the presence of God being around, you need to check yourself out. And see, that's where we are. We've become so casual in our Christianity that we don't really want to see all that God wants to do and can do. I'm not talking about craziness. I'm not talking about uh, gibberish uh, like a, before a pagan king. I'm talking about things that are indecent and in order, but by the presence and the power of God. And I want you to know that when He is absent, those things don't happen. But when He is present, they do happen. When He is present, there are miracles that take place. There are people that get set free. There are people that are healed. There are people that come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are people that experience delivery from addictions and bondages and demonic activity in our life. I want you to know that the devil has not eased up one bit. What we need is more of the presence and power of God in our churches. Amen. 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 I mean, by the way, why are you scared of something that just clearly talked about the Word of God? I mean, it talked about it. We don't have to be afraid of it. you got cat's phobia. Yeah. You know, like claustrophobia? You're scared to be in a closed-in place. It don't matter. It don't matter if people are around or not for me. I mean, some of those caves, you know, people go through and... You know, you can barely squeeze through. I worry about that. Number one, I'm a big guy. What if I get stuck? Uh, and, and the other thing is, I just, man, I just don't like closed in. Well, there's some of you, you're that way about the Spirit of God. You're afraid, man, scared. He's going to be just all nervous. Just get past that and plug in. Amen. You don't have anything to worry about. He, you know, he's not going to hurt you. The Holy Spirit had never hurt anybody. I like what the old mountain preacher said one time. Hey, and listen, I'm all for decent in order. If y'all been around, if you're new here, you don't know that. Uh, but if you've been around here a long time, uh, I'm all for that. There's an old mountain preacher that that, that I know. Uh, his name is Hanley Melby. 
And uh, uh, he was preaching, and he, he's way up in the mountains. I mean, he can preach, though, man. I mean, he can peel the paint off walls. And uh, he, he talks about every time God got to move him through his service, uh, I'm, I'm going to scare some of you to death now. He said he noticed there was this lady. I said every time God had moved through, she'd fall out. So they got to notice that she'd look around and see if somebody's behind her before she fell. <laughs> Make sure somebody's there to catch her. He's praying about it one day and said, God told him to tell his men next time that happened, just move out of the way and let her go. And uh, so he, he's in a meeting with them and he told them, well, what if she gets hurt? He said, I've been praying about this, fellas, and here's what God told me. He said, the Holy Ghost ain't never hurt nobody yet. Amen. And said he ain't going to start now. So the next time, you know, it got good and thick in, in their place. And she was up there. Said they all noticed it. And she's getting ready to go out and look see if she's there. And when she went back, they just moved like a scattered, like a cubby of quail. And let her hit the ground. Wham! <laughs> said, you know what? Said she ain't fell out no more. <laughs> uh, you know, see, all that crazy junk happens. And it scares you to death about, listen, I want you to know. I want you to know anytime there's the real, there'll be a counterfeit. Amen. And you, you need to understand that. But don't discard the real because something counterfeit happens. Amen? What you do is you get plugged in enough to be able to discern what's real and what's not real. And so what we need is the activity of God. And by the way, whatever God has done, He still does and will still do. Amen? And it did not cease just with the completion of canon of Scripture. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at your neighbor and say, He's the same. Yeah, he is. He is the same. I just go ahead and tell y'all this. The, the first service was way more alive than y'all. Just thought I'd let you know that. I don't know if it'll change a thing. You probably won't. Uh, but but they were bad chapters. The one that said we're so subnormal that normal seems abnormal. And he's true. The average church today, if God were to move through miraculously, it would scare them to death. That's how abnormal. We, we are so abnormal that we think that when normal stuff that happened in the Word of God happens when the church gathers, we're like, I don't know about that. And he's the same. Do you get that? And if it has happened, it still can happen. It still wants to happen. God wants it to happen. <laughs> the church is to look like the book of Acts. If you've not read the book of Acts, go home and start reading the book of Acts. And you're going to see that God did some amazing things. And there was some life-giving and life-changing that took place. Okay, look on your outline in Acts 1, 1 through 5. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. And here's what it says. Here's what Luke said. I think Luke is the writer of this book. And here's what he says. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven and given the chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in the early ways that he was actually alive. In many ways, he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once... When he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift of he, the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk to you first of all about the purpose of, of this movement and this recording of this movement in the book of Acts. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. One of them, there is a connective reason. And the second one is there is a directive reason. There is a connective reason, and that is this, that God uses the book of Acts uh, and that movement of the early church to connect what Jesus did in the Gospels to what he did in the epistles and what he's doing in our day. And so it serves as that bridge between the earthly ministry of Jesus and the ministry of God through the Holy Spirit in the early church and in our days. And so there is that connective reason. But then there is a directive reason. And that is that God uses the book of Acts to show us what the church should be about. He uses it to show us what the church should be doing. He uses it to show us the main ministry of the church. And so first of all, let's look at this ideal that it is a connective reason. 
It is connected. And, and, and by the way, uh, if we're going to be a church, we need to be connected to what Jesus did. Amen? If we're doing things that's all about what we want to do that's not connected to what Jesus did, why do we even want to call ourselves a church anyway? Apart from what Jesus did, we have no ministry. Apart from what God has called us to do, we have no ministry. And so we need to understand that there is this connective reason uh, to the writing of the book of Acts and this early movement. In Acts 1.1, look what it says. It says, in my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. He says, in my first book. He's written another book besides this one then, right? Well, what book is that? That was the book of Luke. How do we know that? Go to Luke chapter 1 and let's look at verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. This is the previous book, the previous volume that he has written. It says, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, he's talking about a lot of people writing books about what Jesus did. It said they used the eyewitness reports calculating among us from the early, uh, circulating among us from the early disciples. <clears throat> Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, as you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And so what Luke is saying, there are a lot of people writing a book, but here's what I did. I've investigated it. And I'm writing it, and I'm writing down what the truth is, Theophilus, so you'll know that not only did he write it for Theophilus, but he also wrote it that what the early church could have it and that we could have it. And so his, his intent may have been there. Now, the Word of God says that men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He didn't override Luke's personality, but he used Luke's personality as God directed him to write that Gospel of Luke so that Theophilus would have that account, but that we would have that account, and we would know what Jesus did. We do have four Gospels that have what stood the test of time, that have recorded and have been found consistent to be what led by the Holy Spirit to be written that we have in our Bible that are the accounts of Jesus Christ. And so we know what Jesus did during His earthly ministry. And so we have what this book of Acts, he comes and it comes to the book of Acts so that it can what make that connective and directive uh, account of things so there is that bridge between the Gospels and the ministry of Jesus and the early church and the epistles. You got that? I've said that about three times now. You ought to have that by now. That it made a connection between the Gospels, the epistles, and the early church. Now listen to this. In Luke 12, uh, 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 well, let's go back to verse 1. Look at it again of Acts 1 1. It says, In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything. Jesus, and here's the word, began. Circle the word began. Began to do and teach. Began. It didn't say that it ended, it just said that it started it. Can I tell you something? That the work of Jesus is still going on today. He began it, but it has not ended yet. The, the, the last chapter of the ministry of Jesus has not been written because what there is no Acts chapter 29. And so it is yet to be determined and yet to be fulfilled. And so what, what Jesus did during his earthly ministry was the physical ministry of Jesus. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there is the promise of the Father that has come, and it is the spiritual ministry that's taking place in our day. We don't physically have Jesus walking among us, but we do have Jesus walking among us through the third person of the Trinity, and that is the Holy Spirit of God, and Jesus is real. And we need to understand that in the Old Testament, we saw the activity of God the Father. In the New Testament, we have seen the activity of God the Son. And since the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, we now have the activity of God the Holy Spirit at work in our day. Yes, it is Jesus that saves us. I want you to know that. But it is the Holy Spirit that brings us to that right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ.
convicts us of, of our sin and we repent of our sin and what we are saved and forgiven and we are indwelt with the Spirit of God and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise that we are His child and we're going to heaven. And so we have what Jesus did His earthly ministry physically and we have now what He is doing in a spiritual sense in our day. In Luke 12, 50, He says, I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me and I am under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. There are some translations that they want to talk about that there is a hindrance. In other words, what Jesus was trying to say here is that there's coming a day that I'm going to have a baptism of suffering. He was pointing to the fact of when he would die at the cross of Calvary and suffer our sin in his own body, endure our hell, endure our punishment, and die at the cross of Calvary, be buried and rose again from the dead. Can I tell you something? That's happened. And so now there is no longer this hindrance. There is no longer this baptism of suffering. There is not this to be done. Why? Because it's already been accomplished through Jesus Christ. And so there is no hindrance before the church today. There is no reason that we can't march forward and do like I said last Sunday, attack the gates of hell and see them fall before us. Why? Because God has given us this ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and by the marching orders that He has given us. And He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I want you to know, folks, we're not fighting to victory. We're fighting from victory. And if we're guaranteed victory, why aren't we taking territory? We need to be. We should. We should take territory away from uh, the enemy. And so we see here there's no hindrance. By the way, the only hindrance to, let's get this now. Uh, I'm teaching. The only hindrance to the church is the church itself. Do you get that? The only hindrance for the church is the church itself. Why? Well, God's promised the victory. God's promised the gates of hell can't prevail against us. So what is our, our biggest hindrance? Why did uh, in, in Christendom across the board this last year, why was there a decline? Why were there less baptisms than there had been the year before and way less than there had been years earlier? It's been on a steady decline. Why is that? Is that because we don't have enough power? No. Is that because Jesus hasn't given us the victory? No, because He has given us the victory. And so what is the problem? Is it that the, the enemy's fighting us and we can't overcome the enemy? No. See, we know that. We know based on the Word of God that we have these assurances that what? If we go, captives will be set free. People will be born again. Deliverance will happen. Victory will come. Miracles will take place. But why isn't that happening in the church as a whole? The problem's not with God. The problem's not with the plan. The problem is with the church. And so the biggest hindrance to the church is the church itself. And here's the biggest things that I, that I kind of see about the church. I'm going to get a little personal here. Uh, and, and it may be a little offensive, but you take it home, you chew on it, and see if I'm not telling you the truth. Here's what we want. We want church to be a social club. We want church to be a place where we go and we get to hop and hop with our buddies and our friends. Can I tell you, that's not the main goal of the church. And I mean, you know, the average church, what it, what it does, it's just a social club. I want you to know this, that the church is a hospital for the hurting. It's not a social club. And what we have to do, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. And here's the problem with the church in our day, in our society, is we've not kept the main thing the main thing. And we've made the church not about those that don't know Jesus. We've made the church about us that do know Jesus. And so what we do when we get ready to find a church, what do we do? We look for one that's got everything we want. Can I tell you something? When you look for a church, and I'm not saying that you need to come to this one, you better look for one that keeps the main thing the main thing. Amen? I, I want you to know, we're not going to do basketball leagues and soccer clubs and rec teams and, and uh, we're not going to do indoor hockey. Uh, we're not looking for softball teams. We're not looking for that stuff. Why? Because none of that's what Jesus told us to do. 
What Jesus told us to do was to win people to Jesus Christ. Now, if you're wanting to do all of those things, good. Hallelujah. Join you a rec club somewhere or a country club somewhere and separate your social activity from your spiritual activity and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about what we want. It's about what He wants, and He wants the main thing to be the main thing. Now, what is the main thing? Oh, everybody's quiet. That wasn't a rhetorical question. This is interactive church. It's pretty, it's pretty quiet this morning. I'm hitting the nail on the head. That's it. The main thing is to win people to Jesus. Say that with me. The main thing is to... Win people to Jesus. Let's say it again. The main thing is to win people to Jesus. It's to reach and make passionate followers of Jesus. The main thing. What is the main thing? Oh, y'all are so sorry. What is the main thing? To win people to Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and tell them what the main thing is. All right? I want everybody to get it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, people, it's just crazy to me when they start looking for a church. It's not about ourselves. It's about winning people. I want you to know the Riverwoods Church wants to make it as easy as we can for people to come and be connected. And I mean, we try to do things to help people do that. But I'm just going to tell you that we're not going to do a lot of things that other churches do. And I just think it's clear that you understand that in the future. We're not doing it now, and we're not going to do it in the future. If somebody else wants to do upward basketball, that's wonderful. Let them do upward basketball. Here's what I'd rather you do. I'd rather you go to the, to the school or whatever rec league is there that has absolutely no connection with the church whatsoever and get your kids in that league and get around some parents that don't know Jesus as their Savior and start being salt and light to them. Amen? Start telling them about Jesus. Start loving on them and win them to Jesus Christ and bring them to church with you. Amen? I know everybody like, oh, but Brother Dan, we've got to protect our little babies from the world. We want them to go down to the church league. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I've seen more godlessness down at the church league than I ever saw down at the school. Amen? Amen? I mean, you're not, oh, we've got to protect them. No, what you need to do, you don't need to be protected. What you need to do is get plugged into Jesus, get enough guts and gumption on you to go out into this world in that dangerous territory and take it away from the devil and punch holes in the darkness. Where in the world did we get this idea that God called us all to get in here where it's safe and secure? God didn't call us to come. He called us to go. And so what the biggest hindrance is the church. The church is our own biggest hindrance. Because we've made it about us. We've not made it about Him and about the main thing. I mean, there's people here today, you're like kicking the tires. Riverwood Church, I'm going to kick the tires. I'm going to see if it's what I like. I'm just going to tell you this. You'll love it if you're serious about the Word, if you're serious about winning people to Jesus, and you're serious about taking the gospel to this world we live in. Now, if you're looking somewhere to be appeased, you're looking for somewhere, you know, that they will stroke you and make you feel good, and we'll do some of that too. I'm in a serious revolution. I'm laying the groundwork for where we're going, and I want you to understand it. And if you're looking for all of that, 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 you know, that the world wants to offer. God didn't call the church to do that, and this won't be the place for you. But if you want to be somewhere where souls are being saved, yeah, we're going to have activities for your kids, and we've got youth group, and we've got all, all of those things. But that's about growing them. That's about discipling them. That's about helping them. It's not about entertainment. It's about getting them to fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Can I tell you something that your kids and your youth being entertained is not going to help them handle the attack of the enemy in their everyday life. Oh, we want somewhere where our kids, you know, they got pool tables and they got basketball goals. And they got, uh, yeah, what you need to do is get them somewhere where they fall in love with Jesus and teach them kids to fall in love with Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you what, folks, as we move forward in this world, that's the only thing that's going to make any difference. 
and I'm telling it like it is, and you, and you know that I am. And so what? Uh, uh, we're fighting not to victory, but from victory, and he's given us that problem. By the way, the church is a living organism, not an organization. And you need to understand that. It changes things. So uh, what, what did we see here? We see, first of all, the connection. Uh, the, the, the book of Acts and the movement of the early church made a connection between Jesus' earthly ministry and the church's earthly ministry. Secondly, uh, uh, Jesus' command in all four Gospels is carried out. And we see that in, in the book of Acts. The last words of Jesus <laughs> uh, uh, in Matthew in chapter 28, uh, in verses 18 through 20, Acts 1 2 says this until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 18 through 20, I think it's the first passage of scripture that Logan ever memorized. Here's what it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, this is at the end of, of Matthew's gospel. Actually, it's Jesus' gospel according to Matthew. Uh, but it's also found in Mark's gospel. It's also found in Luke's gospel. It's also found in the gospel according to John. And it's also found in the book of Acts. And so we see this thing that's found in all of those places. Now here's what you need to understand. Is that as a whole, there are a lot of people who say, well that commands that he's given were given to the church. Why well, don't you know those early disciples, that church was in existence and he did give it to the church, but he gave it to those disciples. And so not only was it a command in a general sense to the church, it was a command to each individual disciple. Can I tell you something? That this great commission does not just apply to the church, but it applies to you as an individual. Let me ask you something. Are you helping carry it out? Are you helping carry out the great commission? Or is it about just coming and getting a few gooseies as, as uh, Jennifer Lopez says, and go home and forget about it till the next Sunday. Is, is it about being equipped, filled, challenged, moved forward to carry out the gospel for you? And I'm preaching to a lot of believers in, in this series of messages. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being very clear about it. God did not just give the Great Commission to the pastors and to the denominations and to the churches. He gave it to you as an individual. And so the reason that we have the book of Acts is to connect uh, uh, the movement of us also to see the direction of carrying out that command. When you look at the early church, what do you find them doing? You find them doing the basic thing that Jesus taught. The biggest thing you find them doing is getting the gospel out to others because it said this, what? And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Can I tell you something, that when God moves in a church the way that he wants to move in a church, it isn't just the priest and the religious higher-up leaders that's winning people to Jesus. It's everybody winning people to Jesus. And when they come on Sunday, they come bringing them up the aisle at invitation time and says, Hey, preacher, look who God let me lead to the Lord this week. Amen. By the way, I'll just go ahead and tell you this. You can write this one down. God never called shepherds to give birth to sheep. Sheep give birth to sheep. Think about it. Shepherds don't give birth to sheep. Sheep give birth to sheep. And I'm going to ask you a real personal question. When's the last time you've led somebody to Jesus? When's the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? Oh, I know you want to talk to them about the church. The church won't save them. Jesus saves them. Amen. Amen. And the message of the church is not about the church. It's not about how good our church is and how wonderful our church is. If you're going to talk to them about the church, you talk to them about that the presence of Jesus is there because lives are getting changed and people are being set free and there's victories that are coming and God's moving. Marriages are being put back together and people are being healed and God's sweeping through that place. Don't brag about us. Don't talk about us. Talk about Him. He's the one. Amen. Amen. Uh, he's the one. I, I tell you what, I, I don't want Riverwoods Church to be known. I want Jesus to be known. 
Amen. Now, if he wants to use us, hallelujah, I'm praying uh, that he does. Amen. Acts 28, 18 through 20, he said, go. Uh, go, 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 go. Amen. And here's what you want to do. Listen to me. Because I'm guilty of it too. We want to tell them, come, 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 come. Come on down to our church. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Keep inviting. I tell you that every week. Invite people. But I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to start going, going, going and tell them about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because it is about Him. I'm going to give you the Great Commission in two simple sentences. Number one, win people to Jesus. Win people to Jesus. I mean, we get all we get all this elaborate stuff about the, the Great Commission. By the way, win people to Jesus is evangelism. And you can shake it up however you want to. That's the main purpose of the church. In Dr. Gray Allison's evangelism class, uh, where I went to seminary, it had a had a little sign over there that said, "Keep the main thing the main thing." And we've done decided that the main thing is what? Jesus. No, win people to Jesus. Have you listened? <laughs> I met, that's my sister. I'm messing with her. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a showdown when this is over. Uh, win people to Jesus. Isn't that what we said? The main thing is to what? Win people to Jesus. Thank God. It's like the sixth time. You got it. Fine. <laughs> Amen. Got it. Win people to Jesus. That's the main thing, Dr. Gray. I wish you could sit in this class. For eight weeks, an hour a day for four days each week, I would sit and I would weep. As Dr. Gray taught about evangelism, and he would talk about different parts of the world, and he would say, you know what, we need to go. And he would do this, he'd say, because they're lost. He would go, they're lost. They're lost. Somebody says, why in the world, Brother Aaron, are you about trying to start other churches and trying to continue the revolution and trying to move things forward and trying to do all that you're doing and focus about. Can I sum it up for you? Because they're lost. They're lost. They need Jesus. And without Jesus, they will spend eternity in hell. And I don't believe God's got it already settled about who's going to heaven. If he did, shut this sucker down and go fishing. You can believe that in your theology if you want to. But I want you to know that they're lost. And unless somebody goes and tells them about Jesus, they won't be found. Amen. That's what it's about. Why did Riverwoods Church start? You need to get this and you need to get it well to reach people that don't know Jesus. It's not about keeping a bunch of you happy. It's not about creating an environment where a bunch of church people want to go and sit and get fed and get all spiritually fat. That's not what it's about. And it's not about making sure that you have every need that you want from a church met. I want you to know that if that's what you're looking for, this is the wrong place. If you want to come in here and whine, we're not going to stick pacifiers in your mouth and try to pacify you and keep you happy. What we're going to do is we're going to stay on the trail of a lost and dying world that don't know Jesus as their Savior and we're going to try to find them because they're lost. They're lost. They're lost, folks. They need to know Jesus as their Savior. And I, what we're going to do, we're going to keep the main thing, the main thing. I mean, people quit church for, you can't imagine. Oh, the music's too loud. The music is loud here. Amen. But I want to tell you what, souls are getting saved. And when you're looking for a church, don't worry about how loud or how little the music is, how many kids or youth activities they've got, if they've got upward basketball or soccer, or if they've got some kind of Zumba class that you can go to. When you're looking for a church, find one that's penetrating the darkness and seeing people come to know Christ as their Savior, and they're being delivered from the bondages that they face in their life every day. Find the place where God's at. Find 
find the place where he's working. And when you find that, you'll have everything you need. And then go down there and join the rec club. Amen? Amen? We, we can barely afford just to pump the gospel out, much less carry on a bunch of recreational activities around here. You say, what are y'all do for recreational activities around Riverwoods? We go tell people about Jesus. Amen. Yeah, there's a bunch of us went down. There was over 75 Riverwoods folks scattered out over Nashville yesterday. Left here at 4 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't over it. I'd have got there about 8. We did, but they don't want to stop me. It don't take me that long to eat. Yeah, 4 o'clock in the morning. Somebody, you ever notice people that get up early and have their quiet time, they act more spiritual than people that don't? I just kind of thought I'd throw this in here for a little extra. You, you know, I mean, they're like, I get up every morning, Pastor Darren at 4 or 4.30 and have my quiet time. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have your quiet time in the morning? Yes, I do. Mighty quiet, mighty quiet. <laughs> I mean, I don't care if you do it in the morning, the midday, or evening, or whatever, all three. As long as you make a connection with Him, you ain't more spiritual. Now, it was the custom of Jesus to go early. I mean, there's some, if you, if you went early, you'd be mad at Him. Amen. Yeah. Said, so you wake up grumpy? No, we let Him sleep. Amen. I mean, just let Him stay. Yeah. But it's carried out in all four of them. And, and, and what? Yeah, there are social aspects to the church. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about the main, when we look, think about a church, we're going to have a social gathering next week on, on Sunday evening. I hope you come. We're going to have fellowship now. We're going to have worship. It's going to be inspirational. There's some of you saying, man, I love Jesus and I love Riverwood. You never come to a salt and light and you never go to a gathering. And we encourage you to come to them. Well, I'm just not going to give up my Sunday night once a month. Or I'm, I'm once a, once, four times a year we do the gathering. I'm just going to do what, what, no, if you're part of a body, you ought to be there. Amen? Yeah, go ahead. Preach it, preacher. Yeah. Uh, help Christians grow. I'm going to get on a pet peeve here. You like, you haven't been on one? No. Uh, uh, I, I, I have and, and by the way, if, if you're new around here, you're in a very unique series of messages uh, that we're preaching, trying to lay a foundation for where God wants us to go. And uh, somebody said, man, I just don't know. Brother Graham seems to be a little different lately. Seems like he's, you know, a little angry. I am. I'm angry that people are dying and going to hell. And you can't get the church on fire and excited about it. I am angry. I'm angry that all we want to do is sit at ease inside and have our needs met and care less about the world that's dying and going to hell. I am angry. I'm angry that people who name the name of Jesus don't even have enough guts and gumption to go tell somebody they love that Jesus loves them and they need to know Him as their Savior. I am angry that people just want to go to church to find some kind of entertainment and get the American out of deuces. Yeah, I'm angry. You know what you need to do? You need to get angry. You need to get angry at hell. You need to get angry at the schemes of the devil. You need to get angry that the church as a whole is at ease and sign and let the world die without Jesus. And it's serious business. Help Christians grow. Second part of the Great Commission. Discipleship. I don't have time to get on that. The person of the movement. The person of the movement. There is a main personality of this movement. Does anybody know who it is? You can answer out loud. Who's the main personality of this movement? Jesus. Man, I mean, we've got in the book of Acts, we've got the work of the apostles, we've got the work of the Holy Spirit, but can I tell you who the main personality is? It's Jesus. You see, the Word of God says that when the Holy Spirit comes, when He comes, He will not testify of Himself, but He will testify and point people to Jesus. Can I tell you that any church that really has the emphasis and the power and the fulfillment and the blessing of the Holy Spirit in that church is not going to make big about the Holy Spirit. They're going to make big about Jesus. 
Now, granted, we do need to teach about the Holy Spirit, and there are individual messages, but when I'm talking about the main thing that you hear at their church, if you hear about the Holy Spirit and being full of the Holy Spirit more than you hear about Jesus, something's amiss. Because the Word of God says that when the Holy Spirit comes, He's not going to draw attention to Himself. He's going to point people to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that died at the cross at Calvary, was buried, and rose again. It is Jesus and His blood that paid for our sins. And so the main character of the movement is Jesus. Now there are two truths that leap out at me about this. Acts 1-3 says during the 40 days after His crucifixion, He appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Can you imagine these disciples? They've given nearly three years of their life to follow Jesus. And Jesus Christ is crucified at the cross of Calvary. And he is buried in that tomb. Can you imagine what these disciples would have been like if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? I mean, can't you see them? I'm sure before he rose from the dead, they're huddled up somewhere. You know, they're scared to death. They crucified their leader. They think they're coming after them now. Amen. By the way, they always go after the leader first. And then after they get the leader, they come after others. Amen. But when we get the leader out of the way, that's the way Satan, I preached on it last Sunday if you wasn't there. That's the way that he works. But they, they think, okay, the, the leader's out of the way. I mean, they're scared to death, scared for their life. They're like, man, we've wasted our time. He come and told us we, we thought he was going to uh, bring in us here in the kingdom. And then he was going to reign on the throne. And I mean, they're in there wringing their hands and they're wiping their brow and sweat's running down their face and they're nervous. And they're like, man, we've given everything we had. We give everything we had to follow this. And look, it's a farce. He's just been killed and it's done and it's over. You want me to tell you how I know he rose from the dead? <laughs> they didn't go back to fishing. Matthew didn't go back to being a tax collector. Luke didn't go back to being a doctor. You know what you do? You find them doing the work of God through the book of Acts and in the epistles and they were so convinced in this Jesus that they were willing and some of them gave their life for the cause of Christ. And I want you to know Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is alive. And what He has done, He still does. Amen. And whatever He did, He will still do. I want you to know He's still in the miracle business. Amen. I mean, there are people here today that you're hurting, and you're lonely, and your heart's broke, and you're tired, and you're weary, and you need a miracle. Cry out to Jesus. He is alive. He's not dead. He is alive. You believe that? Man, I mean, then the second thing, he's active. By the way, if you're going to find the church, find one where he's alive. Jesus is active 40 days. Uh, he hasn't quit. He's still working like he always has. The promise of the movement, and I'm nearly done, in Acts 1, 4 through 5. It says, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There are over 9,000 promises in the Word of God. There's only one that's mentioned as the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father is that after Jesus goes, He will send what? The Holy Spirit. Another comforter, another empower, another one to be there. Can I tell you something? We can't do it on our own. We've got to have Him. Here's what you need to know about this. Here's what he tells us. I will be with you. When you decide to move forward, you're going to have the promise and the activity of God uh, in your life. In Matthew 28, 20, he says, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. God knew we couldn't do it on our own. He said in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In the original Greek, he uses five negatives to express one positive to get us to understand this, that he is with us. Thank God he's with us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's with us. Here's what I want you to do. Turn to your neighbor and tell him right now, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God's with you. Reach out. Reach out. 
You know what? Sometimes we just need to be reminded that He's with us. Amen. You know what I found? Listen to me now. Don't lose me. I'm nearly done. I know you're hungry and I know it's getting late and all that kind of stuff, but don't lose me now, okay? Um, here's what I want you to know is that He is there. Whatever your need is, He's there. He cares. He knows. He's with us. And then He said this, I will send the Holy Spirit. I will be with you and I will send. In, in Isaiah 44, 3, he says, For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. And I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. Luke 24, 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. You know, let me tell you, here's what I was going to tell you this second ago. You're like, he, he forgot what it I don't care what the situation is. If I can just sense the presence of God, it makes a difference. There are some times in my life I've had things going on that I have nothing to hang on to except the comfort and the assurance of God through the power of the Holy Spirit that I was His and He was mine and He was there with me. Man, I feel sorry for people who don't know Jesus. I feel sorry for people that's not indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because when they get in those situations, they have to go it alone. But man, for the child of God, can I tell you something, church? I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know if we'll face persecution or not. I could uh, hypothesize about all of that. There's all kind of people hypothesizing. I had a guy who told me yesterday, all jacked up on the Holy Spirit, uh, that we was going to have earthquakes and California was going to drift off into the sea and, and Florida was going to twist off, you know, spin out into the ocean and all that. And I'm like, really? I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But I do know this. One day she's all going to come to an end. And you better know Jesus. And if you don't know him, you need to know him now. Don't put it off. Don't wait another day. If you're here and you're a child of God, plug in. Get into the infantry. Become part of the movement. Become part of the revolution. Say, man, I'm going to be part of the revolution. Get plugged in. You know what River Woods we need to do? He, he, he gave that promise. He said that the promise of the Father was going to come. Isn't that a good promise? But here's what he said. Wait. Wait. Man, I would have thought he'd say go, wouldn't you? I mean, he, he, he's given them all these instructions and he told them at the end of the gospel and he told them in the book of Acts to go out and share the gospel and go around. And he said, but Wait. Wait for what? Wait for that promise of the, of the Father. Wait for the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. You know what that tells me? Is we can't do it in our strength. We have to do it in His. Let me tell you something, church, we have to do. Oh yeah, we, we want to see a revolution. and We want to take territory away. But we better not try it in our strength. We better do it in 